The second speaker of today is Firas Kashauni. I tried, Kashauni. Uh, and he's going to talk about the topological framework for identifying phenomenal phenomenological bifurcation in stochastic dynamical analysis. Uh, thank you, Barbara, for the introduction. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, Barbara did a great job saying my name. She worked really hard on, on learning how to say it. So I really appreciate that. Um, so today I will be talking about um, just detecting what's called P bifurcations, phenomenological bifurcations. I don't want to say that either throughout my talk. So I'm just going to refer to it as P bifurcation, which is what people refer to it in the field. Okay. And this is a uh, work joined with uh, my student, Sonia Tanweer, um, Josh Templeman, and uh, Liz. Okay. So why do we care about this? So if you have a dynamical system and it's deterministic, uh, especially if it's low dimensional, there are these theories that tell you when there is some qualitative change in the system behavior. So for example, you go from a fixed point, stationary response to something that is oscillating. Um, and so they characterize these things using what's called the bifurcation diagram where you plot the varying parameter, which is called your bifurcation parameter, and will show some aspect of the response to the system, for example, the extrema or a maximum. So as the system uh, dimension increases, even in the deterministic case, capturing these bifurcations becomes more complicated. Now, if your system is stochastic, um, if the system is stochastic, then you have a probability density function. So here I'm showing you a joint probability density function. X1 and X2 are the two states, they're stochastic variables, and P is the probability. And you can get shapes that look like this, describing the the likelihood of the system assuming certain combinations of the states. So if we have something like this, and I am talking about now what's called the stochastic bifurcation, more specifically the type that is characterized by a change in the structure of the probability density function. For example, going from a state like the one on the left where I have like a volcano and a peak to the one on the right where I have something that looks like a stochastic limit cycle. So how do we characterize these. There's a bit of a lag when I click and choose there, but hopefully that's okay. All right, so what are what is the state of the art right now to do this? Uh, so there are two types for bifurcation in these types of systems. The first one is the D type or the dynamic type. That one is related to looking at the sign of the largest Lyapunov exponent. That's not the type I will be talking about. I'll be talking about the p-type bifurcation. And the state of the art for this one is visual inspection, is what you will find a lot in the literature. People literally plot these PDFs uh, as a function of the varying parameter, and then they will say things like, it seems that there is another peak appearing at value so-and-so. Uh, or they will look at the number of peaks, or they will use, use uh, Shannon entropy. But all of these methods have limitations. Uh, one of them is, is that this is subjective, so two people can disagree on when that peak appeared or disappeared. Uh, also, it can ignore some richer phenomenon. I will show you some example where we have these PDFs that have in internal structure. Um, so that doesn't capture these things. And then these methods do not apply generally to all kinds of systems. And one thing I should also mention, because of, of the way this is being done right now, the, the thing that I found in the literature was limited to just uh, PDFs, joint probability density functions in two variables, because beyond that, it's hard to see, visualize, and say something about it. Okay, so before I start talking about the approach that we're using, I just want to remind you of the tool that I will be using first. I will be using two flavors of persistence in this talk. The first one is super level persistence. Okay, so here I have just the one slide, the one video to show you uh, this type of persistence that I will be using, and I'll be applying this to the PDFs that I showed you, you get a persistence diagram, and then use that to say something about uh, stochastic bifurcation. Okay. Here I have a partial dictionary to show you uh, several probability density functions. These were obtained from actual stochastic dynamical systems. And underneath, I am showing you the super level set. And so here you see, for example, I have a mono, mono stability, stochastic monostability, where the states favor being in that region, the high probability, the, the peak there. 
And you see that if I take the super level uh, set uh, persistence of that shape, uh, this is H0, so uh, I have one class, right? I have just one point in my persistence diagram over here, which corresponds to that peak. Now, if I do this where I have by stability, so I have uh, two peaks now, same thing, you see that I get now two points in my persistence diagram. And I can show you another case where we have a stochastic limit cycle. And now I am showing both H0 and H1. So you see we have uh, two, uh, we have one H1 component and one H0 component. So what this suggests is that I can perhaps tie the persistence diagram coming from these PDFs to stochastic bifurcation, because I can say something about the shape of the PDF. Here's one that is a bit more interesting where I have a monostability and a limit cycle. And again, I can look at the points in my persistence diagram and say something about the shape of the PDF or character, characterize it without necessarily using visual inspection anymore. And here's a bit more complicated probability density function. This is the one I promised I will show you. It has a bit of inside structure in it. So for example, uh, the one on the left has what looks like a cycle, right? When you look at this from the top, and inside of it, we have two inverted uh, stabilities. Uh, and the one on the left is symmetric. So the system favors both, both uh, stabilities equally. And the one on the right is asymmetric. And you can see there, the system will, with high, higher probability favors one of those two internal inverted stabilities. Um, and so you can see that we also capture that structure in the persistence diagram, those inverted by stabilities. Okay, so I will be working with an example here. Uh, this is called the stochastic duffing oscillator. H here is my bifurcation parameter. And for this system, we're lucky that we can actually get a closed form solution. So we know the ground truth. And so that's the uh, joint probability density function. C is just a normalizing constant. And for this system, for values of H less than zero, I have two peaks, and as H approaches zero, I get one peak, and then beyond that, so for H larger than zero, I have just one peak, okay? So here's a video that shows you what's happening. So I am varying my parameter H. Notice there, I have two points in my persistence diagram, and as H approaches zero, one of them just disappears, okay? Indicating that some change in the structure has happened. Okay, so, so this all looks nice, but there is one problem. I am working with very nice PDFs with closed form solutions. Um, there's no noise in my uh, PDF, um, but that's not the re reality. In real life, you normally have just realizations of your system, you don't have a nice, closed form expression for your PDF. And so to deal with those cases, I'm going to uh, separate the following analysis into two cases. The first one is where I can generate realizations from my system. I can go and measure realization as much as I want, or I can simulate as much as I want. And I can use those realizations to obtain a statistically reliable probability density function. So that's the case that you see on top, the one with reliable KDE. And then I'm gonna talk later about, well, what do I do if I don't have access to uh, numerous realizations of the system? And that will be the case of unreliable KDE and what to do about that. That part of the work is still work in progress, but I will show you the results that we have so far. Okay, so this will illustrate the problem that you probably already know what happens if I add some noise and I do super level persistence. And what I'm doing is counting points in the persistence diagram. This is a probability density function. Uh, we do super level set. We get these nice points here. And we're like, okay, this is great. But now, if I just estimate it using kernel density estimate, your favorite method, you will actually get something like that. Okay. This is a function. I'm just showing you the function sample at certain points, the PDF. I'm just plotting it. Um, and this is what happens to your persistence diagram. So now, if I am counting, it's unclear, I lose the information. I cannot tell how many peaks I have. I cannot tell you if a bifurcation happened. 
And so that's similar to this problem here where we have a nice cycle. We have this nice persistence diagram. And then I had I throw in two random points there in the middle. And then my persistence diagram just gets these extra components in it. So how do we deal with this case? Well, what we are interested in is estimating the homology at every level uh, in our PDF in a reliable way, right? And so for that, we looked at the literature and we found a paper by uh, Omar Bobrovsky, Cheyenne, and Jonathan, uh, where that was exactly what they were interested in. They were interested in estimating the homology of the level sets. Um, and so we took that method and I'm just gonna explain briefly how this works. So I'm interested in estimating the homology at level set L. And what I do here, I go and look at two level sets, one just below and one just above. And that's what I am plotting here. So you see, you see these levels. And, um, and now with these, I am going to use the second flavor of persistence. So now I am going to do a point cloud persistence on these. I'm just going to place circles of radius r. This is just to remind you of point cloud persistence, just to remember that I am now talking about just um, the thickening of these balls around every point uh, in, in my point cloud. And I am uh, just uh, looking at the resulting homology. But in, in, in what I'm doing here, I am not varying the radius. I'm just choosing a radius and I'm placing it on top of all the points. And so I have my estimator sets dl plus epsilon and dl minus epsilon. And I have this inclusion map between these estimators that you see here, l plus epsilon and l minus epsilon. Um, and the idea is that if I have some extra components, uh, by the time I get to l minus epsilon, they all fill in. They all go away, those all spurious components. And this, this inclusion map induces a map on the homologies of these estimators, dl plus epsilon and dl minus epsilon. And the homology of the level sandwich between these two is estimated as the rank of that map, of that inclusion map. So just to summarize what we've done or how this will all fit together, we start with a family of kernel density estimates, uh, possibly noisy. Uh, we extract super level sets. Uh, so we do this, this, what I showed you, we do this at every level L until we get a, uh, consistent estimates for the homology at all level sets. Um, and so that's what we do here for all levels. And then we obtain those diagrams where on the X axis there from minus one to one, I have the bifurcation parameter. And on the, on the Y axis, uh, I have the level set L. And then the color tells me uh, the rank. And in this case, I am looking at H uh, zero, I believe for, for uh, well, I'll show you an example. This is just a cartoon. So you see here, I have, uh, zero or one points. And I look at this diagram when I stack it this way, this is what we call homological bifurcation plot. We look at it and we see when we have a switch in the number. And so here, for example, you see that I have consistently for all levels, I, if I'm going right to left, I have uh, zero components. And then at L uh, up there, I start seeing one component show up. And then as the parameter gets smaller and smaller, I start seeing that component at lower and lower level, L. And so that tells me that I have a P bifurcation happening in my system at that value H. Okay, so this is the, the big game plan, game plan. Here are some examples. So this is for the stochastic docking oscillator that I showed you. Uh, the first plot here uh, uses the clean PDF, the one that we obtained analytically in closed form. Uh, this one in the middle uses the estimated one. So I am I forget that I have the PDF, I'm just estimating it. And then the one on the right shows you the error between the one for the analytical and the one that is estimated. Um, and you can see here that as I hit value H equal to zero, um, I start seeing uh, two components telling me that now I have two peaks in my PDF. And I do all of this without looking at the PDF. And we can theoretically do this uh, for joint probability densities in higher dimensions than just two. Okay, so that, that that's nice. 
Let's see what we can do if we have unreliable KDEs. What is, so this is, as I said, is work in progress. Um, and so here, there are two um, methods that we started by looking at. One is bootstrapping the persistence diagrams. And the other one is to treat persistence diagrams like uh, as point processes uh, and try to replicate the persistence diagrams, get, get more realizations of the persistence diagrams, as was done in this paper by uh, Adler and uh, Agami. Uh, so that's where they model persistence diagrams as GIPS uh, processes. And so that's the one that I will be talking about today. And so the way this is the overview of how this method um, will be applied to our systems. So we have some unreliable, uh, statistically unreliable KDE. Maybe I don't have enough realizations to be to be confident about generating a KDE that will truly represent the state of my system. Uh, we take this and we produce a persistence diagram. Uh, and this is just the birth lifetime persistence diagram. It's called PPD in the paper, projected persistence diagram. Um, then we treat the persistence diagram uh, as a Gibbs process where we have two terms, global interaction points in the persistence diagram and the local interaction term. Um, and from those, we generate a pseudo likelihood. And then we start proposing, uh, perturbing the points to generate a new persistence diagram point, point by point. And then we either reject or accept that new point. And by the end of this iteration, we obtain a new persistence diagram. And we repeat the process to obtain as many persistence diagrams as we want. And then we look at those persistence diagrams and we associate probabilities to the points in these diagrams as being a true point in the persistence diagram or perhaps noise. And that allows us to associate a probability to the bifurcation showing up. So that plot on the right-hand side over there, we have uh, the color indicates the probability and uh, we have um, the y-axis shows the number of points and the x-axis is the bifurcation parameter. And I'll show you an example, but this is the overview of using this method when you don't have a reliable kernel density estimate. So let me talk just a little bit about the terms that I was mentioning. Uh, so we have our persistence diagram and we get the kernel density estimate of the points using any method you want. So this step, you just feed it to your persistence diagram, it gives you back a KDE. That represents the global structure in the persistence diagram. The local interaction term is a bit more complicated. So for that one, uh, we, we are computing the conditional density for each point, giving K of its neighbors and that are within some distance R. Um, and so we do that for every point, we generate that local interaction term. Then we add them all up. So what you see there on the right, the big box is the joint density for local interaction points. And then we add the one that we obtained for the global structure of points from the KD of all the points and the local in interaction of the points, which will give us a pseudo likelihood. And then that's what we use in generating the new persistence diagrams. So here I have an example uh, where we replicated 500 persistence diagram for each bifurcation parameter for the stochastic duffing. Uh, and then we used so here we were experimenting with outlier detection methods. So we tried the Mahalonovis distance, uh, for example, and the bootstrapped confidence uh, intervals with 98% confidence level. Uh, and just to remind you, this is the system where I go from two peaks to one peak. And what you see here are the results. So again, you see here the number of outliers on the y-axis, the bifurcation parameter h, and if you remember the bifurcation occurs at h equal to zero. And then the color tells me the probability. And so based, on this study, it would seem, at least for this example, that the Mahalanobis uh, distance captures the bifurcation a bit better than the, the bootstrap. Um, and you can see that because I have with higher probability uh, that I have um, two peaks for values of h larger than zero, and that probability of the second peak coming in starts increasing. Now, we are trying to benchmark, we're trying to do this for more examples, uh, we are trying to use more methods for outlier detection, including perhaps what Omar was talking about today. It seems that it would fit nicely uh, with what we're trying to do. And all the code that we are working on will eventually make its way to our package, Teaspoon. So this is a package that uh, I co-manage with uh, Liz. Um, and so I encourage you to please take a look. Um, when all this work is done, it will be one of the 
added modules here. Um, and so I we, we welcome contributions and we welcome any comments. Please open a ticket if you spot any issues or if there are any features that you would like added. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for that. So, another great talk. Um, yeah. We have quite some time for. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the exact number we used. You're asking about epsilon, right? Yeah. Yeah, it is a, it's a parameter you can feed into the algorithm, but I can't remember which value we used. Um, yes, the other parameter are gonna ask about R, or should I ask it for you? I was about to ask about R. <laughs> R, yeah, so there is some choice for R. There are um, there are some theorems about R in, in Omer's paper, mm -hmm. but uh, the choice of R is not always clear. I asked my student, how did you choose R? She said it's obvious, but it's not obvious to me how she chose it. Um, and so that's another thing. We're trying to come up with a more uh, algorithmic way, perhaps, for choosing R. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then my question is about, um, so, so it's actually exactly different equations, or you need to know exactly what you're talking about, or like that. Um, and so I think it's a pretty much to look at how the, uh, um, or we can use this method on the practice of the like because the issue there though is that the um we estimate like the basic position of the equation that estimate is very noisy. Um so I'll just um that may be important um to that way. That would be very interesting, yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. And I actually, if, if I if may, I want to ask the audience, you can also, you know, talk to me after the talk. We are looking for models that uh, are not just two dimensional, where there is some kind of known ground truth to test this method on higher dimensions, because we can do it. And I can tell you, I think there's a bifurcation, but if you know of a case where we have three uh, state parameters or higher, where there is a closed form solution or people have figured out that you have a bifurcation. Uh, we would be, I would be very interested in talking to you if you know of an example like that. Yes. Uh, so this, when you take this rank of the map from minus epsilon to plus epsilon, is that somehow for just removing every point that's close to the diagonal with any epsilon or epsilon? Uh, do we only look at the ones that show up in both at the components that are that mm -hmm. that are in both? Mm -hmm. so the, when you do the diagrams, you're only that was um, so that was depending on the level set. Yes. The, yeah. I I fix the level set and then I do this business at, at every level set, mm -hmm. plus and minus epsilon. But um, if if I have uh, an extra loop showing up. In, in one of these two, but not the other, uh, that one I just drop, just goes away. I only look at the uh, yeah, the components that, yeah. That would mean that that loop is somehow insignificant. At least if it only shows up in one. Uh, yeah. So. Well, it may be a loop that start there, but it has a longer persistence, right? So it's not close to the diagonal. Yeah, but that's, then it's gonna show up and that's another L. Right? Oh, one. okay, in that sense. Yeah, I, I keep just bounding things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I assume go up, build it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So in the in the diagram, then then I'm wondering if that's uh, almost the same as just throwing away the points that are close to the diagonal because they are never going to show up in along that from uh, minus epsilon to epsilon. Or Is that how we? Yeah. Right. This this sounds like a familiar discussion we had. <laughs> I can't remember what the conclusion was. <laughs> But I think yeah, you could find a complex number of something close. Possibly. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we also not going to say we don't actually need this to either we So we need to that the from the core. We just plot part of the sum part that has the function values that have this particular level set. Mm -hmm. And then those are the ones we really just complex to have. Yeah. So that can be and what you're aiming for. Mm -hmm. We had another.
Proceed. In the topological persistent case, uh, you have an estimator. You have times to get a confidence interval or confidence set, but then you can try to bound what bound field is with other boundary. Mm -hmm. That sounds nice. Yeah. <laughs> We, you know, we uh, this is this is where we start, but then we're in, we're interested in absolutely bounding things, and I I am very interested in figuring out a way to also set all those parameters. The, the good question I got about epsilon and r, um, maybe the two questions are related, right? Um, so yeah, this is very much ongoing work. We have uh, one paper um, on the first part, the one with the reliable, and then we are now working on the unreliable bit. Yeah, thank you. Yes. I guess uh, for that, uh, you envision this for a more general question. You envision bifurcation. If you if you can make a bifurcation, you can make Yeah, actually, one of the examples Mike uses in his paper is precisely this: the kernel density estimate and how you can look at a range of R's, right? The uh, the parameter in KDE. Um, I am I am very interested. I'm just I just don't know. Um, I guess I have to learn a bit more about multi-parameter persistence. Or rather, maybe have my students learn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just need more algorithms. And more what? <laughs> more algorithms. Yes, yes, yes. That's, that's something that we should do. Okay. Yeah. More questions? If not, then let's thank Peter. <laughs>